Hello and welcome back to another video of Crime Time with Tyler. If you're new here, welcome. And if you're not new here, welcome back. Warning, this video may contain descriptions of shootings, bullets, guns, uh, victims of shootings, blood, descriptions of bullet wounds. If any of this is a trigger to you, if you are sensitive to this, please depending on how severe it is i advise you to click off of this video and watch something else on my channel i do have other crime time videos as well as more light-hearted things if you decide to continue watching this video you have been warned so this is not my fucking fault today we are going to be talking about a serial killer who basically terrorized the state of new york in the 70s um the weapon of his choice dubbed him the title the 44 caliber killer but you may know him mostly as the son of sam we're going to start from the beginning as always you guys know how it is um i did not find very much information on the parents uh, and some details of the story. So if I am short in any area, it's not intentional. It's because a lot of information was dry um, in some resources that I had used to um, put this together. So for the most part, you guys know I'm very thorough. Let's start from the beginning. Um, Tony Falco and Elizabeth Betty Broder were married for no more than four years before before Tony decided to opt the fuck out. Um, he had left Betty for another woman, woman, leaving Betty and their only daughter behind. Basically, Betty was taking care of their, their daughter, and it was said that the couple at one point had opened up a fish market that she was running on her own. Um, Betty was a Jewish woman, and Tony Falco was a downright Italian man. Later on, Betty would become fond of a, another married man named Joseph Kleinman. Uh, Joseph Kleinman and Betty were together for, I think, like three years, a couple years before she ended up getting pregnant with their child. Joseph Kleinman honestly seemed like an asshole. He really, really, really talked like did his best to talk Betty out of having the child and when he noticed that she was indeed going to keep the child he did everything in his power to basically rid himself of this connection like he his goal was basically to hide any any breadcrumb that would give away the fact that he was cheating on his wife that he was currently married to so he told Betty that, I mean, everything you could think in the book, I'm going to leave you if you have this kid, I'll never talk to you again if you have this kid, if you're going to have this kid, you got to get rid of it, um, or, you know, don't give him my last name, and honestly, that's exactly what Betty did. Um, she ended up having the child, and she didn't give the child Joseph Kleinman's last name. In fact, since Betty was still on paper, um, married to Tony Falco because they never officially divorced, Betty had ended up giving the child Tony's last name instead. So Benny, Betty ended up giving birth to a boy, baby boy and named him David Richard Falco. Um, she gave birth to him on June 1st in 1953 in Brooklyn, New York. David Richard Falco as I mentioned, Joseph did not want anything to do with him, even though he was by his biological son. So Betty, it said a couple weeks later, 10 months later, Betty had ended up finding a really nice couple that was willing to adopt David. And their names were Pearl and Nathan Berkowitz. Uh, when Pearl and Nathan adopted Richard, they renamed him to David Berkowitz. Uh, I apologize. I kept saying David when I meant to keep referring to him as Richard, but that's how we get the name David Berkowitz. So they ended up naming him David Berkowitz. Pearl and Nathan Berkowitz are described as a nice Jewish couple who had taken David in as one of their own because they were experiencing issues with infertility when attempting to have children of their own. Um, it was said they owned a retail store. I believe it was a hardware store of some kind and were well off on their own. Although they were able to provide him a really nice childhood, which was kind of a little bit of 
the reason why Betty had given him up for adoption is because she knew they would be able to give him an education, a roof over his head, food on the table consistently because, you know, they were struggling with the fish store and Tony had left her and Joseph seemed like a straight up asshole in my opinion. For the better of her son, she gave him up for adoption to this couple. And although this couple was seemed really nice and sincere to David, he, David was a problem child. Um, I mean, it was said by family, friends, and relatives, even the whole fucking neighborhood was like calling him a bully. They literally said that he was a bully, he was a menace, a nuisance, his parents had to deal with a lot of tantrums and a lot of, um, what is that called? You know, he was greedy, um, outlashes, uh, that's the word I was looking for. He was just a very difficult child. And, you know, it's a very odd thing with this story is when I was doing my research, it was really hard to differentiate between different media sources as to what was the truth and what wasn't. Because, you know, you'll hear me say, based off my research, was which was from the internet and the internet saying in a lot of articles that David was a difficult child growing up. But then when you listen to actual interviews of David himself, you know, he'll say his parents were great. They loved him. They were patient with him. He may have been dealing with depression and a bit of, you know, mental instability, um, but his parents were always there to take care of him. And, you know, so it's, it's kind of hard. I'm just putting both narratives out there for you guys so you can make your own decision. But it was kind of hard reading about this story because it's like, okay, what is left and what is right? I, I mean, you know, so, and I just feel frustrated about it because it's like, mm, it's a good old fashioned example as to the media really trying to make somebody out to seem like they are, they're, they're this, they're trying to make somebody out to be someone they're not. I don't know why that was so hard to say. But yeah, so relatives would say that he was selfish, destructive, and that he was even partaking in minor offenses like petty theft, vandalism, stealing small things that didn't cost more than five bucks. But as we all know, a lot of people start off small and eventually climb the ladder to bigger, more serious crimes. I guess what really kept David anchored was the fact that he was very close with his adoptive mother, Pearl. Pearl Berkowitz was this guy's rock. I mean, he loved her. They were close. They spent a lot of their day together. She nurtured him since he was a baby. He was a lot closer to her than he was with his adoptive father, Nathan. Which, that being said, it was unfortunate when Pearl Berkowitz had passed away from breast cancer in the year 1967 when David was only 14 years old. His happiness quickly came to an end and with Pearl's passing came with the destruction of his world. Um, I mean, if you think about it, David was an adopted child. He understood that he stuck out like a sore thumb, um, you know, when it came to his parents and their community and their family and their relatives. I mean, it's, it's not, difficult for adoptive children to kind of have the feeling that they did not originate there. So he, with the passing of Pearl, his adoptive father, Nathan, from my understanding, did not have trouble moving on to the next, the next thing. He ended up acquiring a woman in his life and that woman became David's stepmother and he could not stand her from, you know, according to resources. He did not like her. Um, he saw her as a replacement for Pearl and just in general as the person she was It was documented that he just did not get along with her. So Nathan kind of moved away did his own thing um, In interviews with you know, David he would also talk about how like they would they moved out of state and he would stay in touch with Nathan But they weren't very close um, David had enlisted himself in the army to kind of escape the tension between him and his adoptive father that 
was present after Pearl's passing. David had enlisted himself into the military where he served from the year 1971 to the year 1974. Um, after the year 1974, it was said that David Berkowitz was honorably discharged from the military, although the reason specifically as to why was never stated. And that to me, I wish they would, I wish they would have mentioned it or included it because now I'm over here like why what happened just because of my own theories you know but I'm gonna save that towards the end when David had come back from serving in the US Army it is documented that he had turned to Christianity for a short time but shortly fell out of it um, within the same year he did his own research and managed to hunt down his biological mother Betty Broder um, you know and the internet and media sources will go on to say that the reunion was just it was a sad reunion it was not what david had expected that he hated meeting her he he didn't like his adoptive mother but in an interview with him personally he would go on to say that meeting with his biological mother was actually a very happy reunion and he was so thrilled to have met her and got to speak with her he met his half-sister, he learned where they lived, he learned the origin of himself, and although, yes, a portion of it was not what he expected and not what he wanted to hear, he was still happy to have learned something about his origin, um, which that sad portion was the fact that Betty Broder had um, explained to David that his biological father was the reason that she had given him up for adoption and that she alone was not able to afford to have a second child because she was already taking care of his half-sister and this, you know, abandoned fish market that they had launched together. Um, she had mentioned that Joseph Kleinman had passed away in the early 70s um, and Tony Falco, she was... I don't... Re I can't recall if she said she was still in touch with him or he also had passed away or, or they had fallen out of touch since he had initially left her many years ago but i mean both of his father figures early on in his life were pretty much non-existent and wanted nothing to do with him and that of all things is what really hurt david at this time david would go on to say that he was moving forward with his life he had enlisted himself in Bronx Community College. He was getting some sort of education and working towards a career, trying to figure out what he wanted to do for the rest of his life. While he was in the military, he said that he saved up enough money to buy an apartment of his own um, and get a kickstart on rent and live in his own place. He also worked as a security guard for a short amount of time before taking on a position as a postal worker in the local postal office um, and his life was in his his eyes was moving forward you know he was doing something he was active and he didn't feel stuck for the first time in his life except for in one area his social life he felt lonely and he felt like he could have more sustenance in that area in his life which I totally get that. Like, I feel like to a certain extent, I'm kind of selectively social and antisocial at times, but I mean, I still want human interaction. I still want friends. Even if it's like one or two, I, at least I have somebody to occasionally sit down with and talk with or drink with. And that's what David was looking for. David mentions that he had gone to a party in the neighborhood and he met some interesting people which is a nice way of saying <laughs> i met the bat shit crazy people that got me in this fucking mess like let's just be honest interesting people who the fuck says that nobody says that and sorry so anyways there is an apartment complex that david lives in and around the corner he goes to this party on his block and he ends up meeting John Carr and Michael Carr who live in the same neighborhood right around the corner from their father, Sam Carr, okay? And when David went to the party, he first met Michael Carr who then introduced him to, excuse me, his brother John Carr. And then from there, the Carr brothers, they then introduced David to their group of friends. So this group of friends was 
basically a satanic cult. Some media sources later on go to say they called themselves the children and some say that they were the sons of Sam. So this is where it gets a little, at least I couldn't find anything on the internet. This is where it gets a little like hard to bridge where we go from meeting each other to, hey, let's go fucking kill people. Because they go straight from meeting each other, realizing that David is very vulnerable and thirsty for friendship and companionship because he's so lonely that they end up manipulating and taking advantage of that and gaslighting him into joining their cult, brainwashing him, and basically convince him to assist them in killing people. So as we know, in the 70s, there was a very large span of satanic panic. Satanic panic was basically like people fearing the unknown. They didn't know like what cultists were or satanic groups or people who worshiped Satan or preached Satanism were and what they were doing. And there were people fucking crazy enough to kill people over it, like this situation and Charles Manson and so on, that it ended, like people didn't question it. They were just like, yeah, these people are out here. They get a whiff of the satanic cult anywhere. And they're just like, I'm Audi 3000, bitch. You're not going to see me here. No, because they would kill people. They would kidnap people, kill them, sexually assault them, and fucking sacrifice them. Like, it still happens to this day. You just don't see it as much because they've learned how to be discreet. But also, I feel like people just aren't scared of it as much nowadays. It's not very common. Um, and I'm entirely, and that's an interesting thing to, to ponder. It's like, why was it popular back then? Why did it die out? Maybe I should do a video on that. I will do a fucking video on it. Don't even try me. Stay tuned if you want to see a video about that or, or give a like if you would or put it in the comments if you would like to see that because that's actually very curious now. Like why did we see a sudden drop in that? You know what I mean? Because it was all, that was what it was about in the 70s. Like crime had an uprising because you had fucking the Night Stalker and Charles Manson and the Son of Sam and other sort of incidents that were categorized as satanic cult activity. And so people were scared. They didn't leave their house. We'll kind of get into that, you know? So anyway, sorry. I feel like they really preyed on him. They befriended him because they're like, here's a dude that we can sense is weak-minded. He's already mentally um, weak enough for us to compromise his thoughts and his feelings and manipulate them into making him do whatever we need like i don't know how to explain it but charles mansion charles manson is a good a example because charles manson and when i recall like his victim sharon tate i just think about how like his minions his mindless satanic minions did a lot of the bloody work for him he was honestly a leader. He had them do his bloody work for him. And people were like, how did he do that? How did he convince grown adults to do his deeds for him? And if you think about it, and he's even said it before, and I think um, somebody did research on that whole situation because people were genuinely wanting to know how in the fuck did he get people um, to follow him so so like so committed to him that they literally stabbed a not like a pregnant a nine month pregnant woman a, a woman who was nine months pregnant Sharon Tate was eight nine months pregnant and she got stabbed in the stomach by his one of his mindless satanic cult minions and it's like, how do you have so much power over somebody? Or if not power, how do you convince them enough to do that for you? And people would, people, experts would research it and they would say it's because he would, he would find their weak points. He would try to understand what their trauma is, what's bothering them, and he would use it against them. 
and we're talking about people that have been expelled from their houses for some reason um cast it out of their family because they you know they blew the whistle on somebody um people that were not wanted by their families and so he played on that oh i'll be there for you i would never abandon you because i'm your real family and then you would turn it into his favor and since we're real family i would do anything for you you would do anything for me and you should do this because i'm your family like shit like that that's how he got people to kill for him like i don't know how to articulate it in words very well but if you know how to push the right buttons at the right time, you can make it, you can make it work. You really can. So that's what they did to David. Um, so with that being said, David soon met their father, Sam Carr, who somehow has a relation in this because his dog, Harvey, a black Labrador would be a very big piece in all of this. So when all the attacks had gone on and after everything, you know, David would go on to say that he was taking orders from a possessed dog named Harvey who belonged to Sam Carr. Now, I honestly don't know if that's just a cover up, if that's to make him seem mentally unstable. So the court kind of takes pity on him and lessens his sentence or they're less likely to think that he did it intentionally but just is mentally unstable so he's homicidal or whatnot. But I don't know. Sam Carr is described in letters to the police and just in general of like neighbors and relatives to be a very abusive individual. He used to lock his kids in the basement or the attic without food and water for days. He used to chain them up in the backyard beat them when he was drunk and so i feel like he is a part of the occult the cult you know what i mean um just because of the descriptions of who he is as a person and not only that if you think about it john and michael carr are literally the sons of sam dun 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 like honestly when i heard that the first time somebody had put it that way in a podcast when I was doing my research I was like Phew. like that just so small but just blew my mind and now I'm gonna get into the murders so again there's no research closing the gaps of how we went from we just met this guy now you're in a cult now you're brainwashed i mean maybe it's just as simple as that i'm just saying like i wish i could find more details as to how this was put together because i didn't think i thought there was just more to okay we met this guy now we're gonna like take him around and just start shooting people july 29th 1976 the killer attacks his first victims. Jody Valenti was 19 years old and Donna was 18 years of age and both girls attended West Westchester Heights High School. The previous night before July 19th, which was a Wednesday, July 28th, a family relative had stated that the girls had borrowed Jody's mother's car to go to a disco thief in New, New Rochelle, New York. Uh, upon returning, Jody had gotten Donna back home past midnight. Before Donna went inside to her family, they sat in the car talking for a while. It was a normal night. Donna and Jody were just hanging out, dishing out the recent gossip. And even at one point, Donna's parents had returned from a night out for themselves and had even stopped by to talk with the girls for a bit before turning inside. Donna's father was even like, Hey, I'll give you some guys some time to talk and like kind of wrap up. I was thinking maybe I'll get the family dog. We can go for a walk, you know, let him use the bathroom and then turn in for the night. The girls were content. Donna's parents went inside and after their parents had left, a man from the shadows had emerged with a gun. Before either girl could react, the man had aimed his gun at them, shooting a total of four times. The first bullet had crashed through the window on the passenger side and struck Donna in the temple, killing her instantly. The second bullet had struck Jody in the thigh. The third ricocheted off the door, off the passenger side, leaving a mark, and the fourth bullet had lodged itself into the passenger seat. Their assailant had fled the scene before Donna's parents and witnesses came running to the streets where the gunshots were heard. Although Jody was wounded, she still got out of the car to rush to Donna's side, not knowing that she had died upon impact, and opened the door to see if she was okay. 
Donna's body had fallen out of the vehicle onto the floor and her father had rushed to her body hysterically crying. Um, witnesses told the police that they had never seen the man before, but the description that they had given the police was that he was a white man in his late 30s and was wearing a blue striped shirt. Jody had described her attacker to the police as a white male in his 30s, approximately 5 foot 8, 200 pounds, and had short, dark, curly hair. Sound familiar? Look familiar? The second murder was October 23rd, 1976. Carl De Niro was 20 years old and Rosemary Keenan was 18 years old. The two were boyfriend and girlfriend. They were just hanging out in their car after seeing a movie with one another in Flushing, Queens, New York. As the couple were sitting and enjoying the night, the killer had again emerged from the shadows with a gun. The gunman had shot a couple times, but missed except for one bullet that had pierced Carl in his temple. Miraculously, Carl did not die upon impact. He was able to survive the bullet wound um, and just needed a steel plate installed in his head um, through surgery. So he did get shot in the face, but survived and Rosemary a bit was documented to have walked away with barely a scratch. Carl De Niro tried to make himself a very big character in this case, but to be, and the reason why is because according to my research, he used to smoke weed and in the 70s, as we know, that was like highly illegal. The police, I'm not entirely sure what direction this was going, but there's two things. So he said that the police were trying to pin on him that this was like a turf war between him and a drug dealer. Even though he wasn't a drug dealer, he just smoked weed as far as I know. And he went on to say that he didn't believe David Berkowitz had shot at him because he thought he saw a woman shooting at him. But then again, like, I don't know if he really even saw his attacker because he got shot in the face, basically he got shot in the head. He feels like a cult was after him, like a whole ass cult, different people that are not even attached to this story. And honestly, I have to call it bullshit. I don't think you can really make accusations without proper evidence and facts. And this guy just really has theories and verbiage to back up whatever he's saying. And it's like, who am I to speak on his experience? Like, yes, he was the one that was shot, but he also didn't have a description for the police. This was honestly after the fact that somebody else, a I believe he was an investigative journalist named Terry Mari. He was the one that believed there was a cult tied to this and that it was bigger than just a murder, like a serial killer. That's when Carl had the narrative that a cult was after him, was after the fact somebody else had fucking said it. I feel like the only way you can really prove that David did it or not is if the cops were actually doing their fucking job and did a ballistics test. If they took the bullet that hit Donna in the face and they took the bullet that lodged itself into, into Carl's vehicle or even his head and they ran a test to see if the bullets matched then you would know for sure that it was David Berkowitz. So on too big of a rant, so I'm just gonna say like, if they did the ballistics testing, then we would not be here, okay? I don't know, I feel like sometimes events happen to people and they just run with it and try to get money in their pocket. Like, glad you survived, I really am. Not at all disrespecting that or speaking on it yeah the police were he was saying the police were trying to pin him as like a drug dealer like oh and i think what it was is the cops a lot at points here with you know everything going on they were definitely trying to they saw that this was a situation like it's the second time somebody's somebody's been shot at in their car the profile fits that women with long dark hair in their early ages are being targeted specifically and this is the second occurrence the police have noticed that this has happened and i feel like in order to manage the panic in the state of new york they're they were trying to make this incident in particular seem like it was not related to the previous incident with jody and donna you know even though it was so i mean i do I will give some leniency to Carl when he says to the media that he believes like they were trying to pin something on him. I don't deny that. I just think he can't really know for sure like who attacked him, you know, not unless the police actually did their fucking job, which they of course never do as we know, like 
investigated the ballistics and the evidence, you know? Don't get me wrong, some cops do their job. For the most part, cops are really just trying to save their ass, especially in the 70s. I've covered some cases like the career girls where even in that story, the cops were immediately trying to pin the murder on the first person to be suspected of, you know, killing them. And that first person that they convicted of the crime actually didn't end up being the killer. It ended up being entirely somebody else. They couldn't place the person at the crime scene, nothing, but they still convicted him. And this was in the 70s as well, or around there, I believe. And it just gives me that kind of echo, that same energy here, that the police were like, yeah, you didn't actually get shot at by the guy who killed like Jody and Donna, like this was a turf war with your drug dealer, blah, 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 and Carl's just kind of like, what the fuck, dude, like, I'm just out here with my girlfriend on a random ass night, and I just got shot at, you know what I mean? So I will, I understand that, but like, he thinks a cult was out to get him, like, I'm sorry, Carl, but like, you're not that special you're not on their radar that much like they just kill to kill at any random time and you just happen to be there but of course we would again wouldn't really know that unless the cops ran the fucking ballistics test we just won't know november 27th 1976 um, Donna DeMassi, who was 16 years of age, and Joanne Lomino, who was 18 years old, were headed to Joanne's home in Floral Park, Queens. It was said that as they were about to head inside or they were hanging on the front porch talking, they were approached by a man in military, um, in a military attire. He was apparently blonde, according to witnesses, like completely different features versus the descriptions that were given in the first incident with Jody and Donna where it was like a dark curly haired man who was like white and 200 pounds five foot eight we had a different description here apparently he was like asking them for directions and on how to get somewhere and as they were talking and they were engaged in the conversation that's when he took out his revolver and he shot each woman once what is it called donna was shot in the neck but she did survive with her wounds without permanent injury and joanne was shot in the back although unfortunately she was not able to walk away she didn't survive her wounds she was paralyzed from the waist down january 30th 1977 we have Christine Frund, who is 26 years of age, and her fiance, John Deal, who is 30 years old. They are both shot in Flushing, Queens, um, as they sat in John's car talking. Again, we have a consistent pattern of the killer preying on people that are basically setting ducks and idle in their vehicle. Um, unfortunately, John was shot twice, and he died later. Oh, no, no sorry. John... Unfortunately, Christine was shot twice and later died in the hospital, hospital whereas John had survived his wounds. Um, at this point, the cops begin to take the ballistic test seriously. I don't understand why... What, what, what was this? The one, two, three... I don't understand why after the fourth attack they decided to run the fucking ballistics test but they now determined that the bullets were indeed matched to a 44 caliber revolver bulldog revolver um and that was the weapon of choice that the gunman was using to shoot these people um and in some of these shootings i know i've mentioned a man even though like i was saying that the pattern was mostly women uh, but a lot of people were saying that the men actually had Similarly to the women, long, short, black hair. And as we know in the 70s, that was a hairstyle that men did have, um, depending on their preference. But a lot of police and experts believe that the reason the men were still getting shot along with their girlfriends or fiancés was because the killer had mistaken the men as another young woman from behind, given the hair. March 8th, 1977, after returning home from her classes on college campus, Virginia Voskrchin, I don't know if I said that correctly, I apologize. She was 19 years of age and she lived in the same neighborhood as Christine Frund and had been at attacked by being shot in the head by the gunman. Uh, again, they had suspected it was the same bullet that was from the previous shootings and they identified this as another killing by the 44 caliber killer 
um, Son of Sam. April 17th, 1977, we have Valen Valentina Suriani, uh, who is 18 years of age, and her boyfriend, Alexander Isao, I apologize if I'm mispronouncing that, I'm pretty sure I am, uh, who is 20 years of age. They were both sitting in Valentina's car, just talking near her home in Bronx, New York, when they were each shot twice. Um, Alexander died at the scene and Valentina would later die in the hospital. Uh, this is when for the first time the killer, the gunman, had announced his identity. He had left a handwritten note for the police at the crime scene that he wanted them to, of course, hopefully discover. Um, and he referred to himself as the son of Sam in this letter. If I am able to find it, I'll pop it up on the screen. Um, and in the same letter, he promised that the killings would continue. May 30th, 1977, um, we have the Daily News columnist uh, Jimmy Breslin who received a handwritten letter from somebody claiming to be the shooter, son of Sam at this point. Um, and if I could find that letter, I will pop it up on the screen as well. But it basically just goes over a brief touch on the victims. He says something about, um, like he mentions Donna Loria and telling Jimmy Brunslin to not forget her. And you cannot let the people forget her either. She was a very, very sweet girl. But Sam's a thirsty lad and he won't let me stop killing until he gets his fill of blood. The letter was signed, Son of Sam. And the Daily News, thanks to Jimmy Breslin, who had received this. I'm not entirely sure why it was sent to him or if he just came across it specifically. It's kind of fucking spish, but okay. Um, and 10 days later, they published it. And it was known for the Daily News to be like the time, at that time, like their highest selling, like at the time for the Daily News, that was like, when they had sold the most copies ever they sold like 1 million copies and it was because of like how popular this topic was and how scared people were they wanted to know the most recent updates and scoop on what was going on i mean dude at this time like women were literally flooding salons i think i think around this time like people were starting to understand there was word that there was a pattern of the killer um, specifically targeting women with dark long hair um, before the police had officially put a pro profile out and officially were saying like, yeah, okay, we have a fucking problem on our hands. And even after women were going to salons, they were chopping their hair, they were dyeing it blonde, they were literally trying to reconfigure themselves because they put out there that there was a pattern for a reason, like that was his specific target. June 26, 1977. Um, after leaving a discotheque in Bayside, Queens, Judy Placido, who was 17 years of age, and Sal Lupo, who was 20 years old, um, were shot while again sitting in Sal's car, just talking, having a good night, minding their own business. And they both survived their injuries. Um, and Sal, it is documented, documented that... Thankfully, both couples had survived their injuries. So this was like an attempted murder, but they were like the first couple to really walk away with. I mean, not the first, like Carl and his girlfriend had survived and whatnot, but they were the first to like have an attempted murder, but they were okay. Um, July 31st, 1977, um, Robert Violante, who is 20 years of age, and Stacy Mouskowitz, who is 19 years old, uh, were shot while sitting in Robert's car. Again, they had, Robert had said they had just gotten off of a date and they had found a really nice park to, you know, park their car, get out and, you know, kind of sit, um, you know, swing, play on the swings, he said. Like they were just talking and hanging out before wrapping up for the night. They had found a nice park bench to sit on. And Robert had said that they were called seeing like a man that was acting suspicious in the park but they didn't really think anything of it because the man was still kind of minding his P's and Q's. So they were just enjoying themselves when all of a sudden, you know, they went back to the car and they were shot at. Robert said that um, he recalled hearing a loud bang and suddenly his vision had been wiped from him. He wasn't entirely sure what would hap had happened, so he didn't register what was going on until 
he had heard Stacy moan and he kind of pieced together like the loud noise, his vision being gone, the pain, you know, Stacy not responding. And he had thought to himself like, holy shit, we were just shot. Um, Robert went on to lose his vision in both eyes as it had pierced him in just the right spot enough to make him completely lose his vision. Unfortunately, Stacy would die 18 hours after the attack, which was the first one to take place in Brooklyn and the first one to involve a victim with blonde hair who was Stacy. So at this point, they kind of start changing up the profile. And I don't know if that was to like mess with society, like the people of the public, like they must have known that there was a major incline in business for salons and women chopping their hair off and dyeing their dark hair blonde. I always wondered if that was like to taunt them. Like you can dye and chop your hair off all you want, but like we're killing anybody out here, but mostly young women. Couples it seems to be too. After this incident, um, a witness had come forward to the police and told them that they had seen a man with a gun uh, minutes before the shootings and that she had seen other police officers kind of monitoring parked cars and handing out tickets that night. Um, and when they had searched the vehicles and the tickets that were handed out that night, they had identified that where they had linked David Berkowitz to these incidents, to these shootings. And he was happened to be there the night that the officer was handing out tickets and they investigated him because they found that there were complaints of harassment to his neighbor and they figured you know the other people i don't know i don't know why they pinpointed him or narrowed him down because if you think about it it's like they, well, i mean i guess maybe they looked into the other people's like profiles and public records and maybe they didn't find anything and then david berkowitz just happened to have complaints of from his neighbor of him harassing his his neighbor so then they just kind of like look, looked into that and I guess it, that's just kind of where it went. August 10th, 1977, David Berkowitz, who was 24 at the time, was arrested and the next day he had literally confessed to everything. At this point, I mean, first of all, when the cops ran up on him to investigate to see if they, that he was actually their guy, David, <clears throat> he was not prepared for that. So they literally found him with, it said, in some of my resources that he was arrested with ammunition in his pocket that in the back seat of his car a rifle was discovered along with maps of the crime scenes and even more ammunition and there was a bag containing the 44 caliber revolver that was the notorious weapon the gunman had been using to shoot these innocent people and when david berkowitz was arrested apparently he had said to the arresting officer well, you got me with a smile on his face. And if you look at some of the photos when he's arrested or even when he's just being escorted around to the courthouse and whatnot, I mean, this guy is literally smiling. Like he loves, you can tell he loves um, the attention, you know, which didn't make him look good. Following the day that he had confessed about the shootings, he had then told the police about how he was taking he was carrying out demands from a possessed demonic dog named Harvey, who the demon was like an ancient demon named Sam. And the demonic spirit spoke to him and told him to kill people. And he had also told police that he was responsible for 1,500 fires set around the city of New York. That's insane. He was 23 at the time of his very first murder. And... Yeah, that's why they call him the son of Sam. He literally told the police, like, um, you know, I'm taking orders from my former neighbors, like Black Labrador. May 8th, 1978, David Berkowitz withdraws an insanity defense and pleads guilty to the six murders, being given six 25 years to life sentences. So basically, um, he is in there for the rest of his life and he is not allowed parole. And once he was uh, admitted to prison, he then started opening up about the cult that had admitted him into their group, brainwashed him and talked him into and kind of said like forced him into killing these people. Um, you know, the interesting thing after he was arrested is, one, he never opened up about this shit until he was arrested. 
and it just makes me think if that was to protect himself because if this cult did exist i mean sometimes they kill people off just to keep them quiet so nobody discovers that they're actually out there and the and then the reason i believe that is because john carr and michael carr so john carr shortly after give it a couple months or so had just had died shortly after david berkowitz was arrested right so John Carr had died by shooting himself in the head and a lot of people believed it was like a homicidal act. There was no investigation. There was no real answer as to why this guy was just found in a relative's or girlfriend's house, I believe it was, just dead on the floor, shot himself. And literally almost 18 months after John Carr had killed himself, his brother, Michael Carr, had mysteriously died in a car accident. Sorry, I just had to. But he died in a car accident and police believed, given the scene, that somebody had driven him off the road. Somebody had made him feel intimidated and unsafe enough on the road that he had literally driven himself off a cliff or some sort of like landslide, like dip, that he literally tumbled in the vehicle and he had died from impact. It just makes me think like, was it to keep them quiet or to punish them for this getting out? Like, I don't know. Like, are we dealing with different chapters of a cult? And maybe like John and Michael Carr just didn't manage it properly. So like whoever is really at the head of this shit just wanted them dead. And then all of a sudden, David Berkowitz goes off to say in interviews that he just wanted this to be over with. He didn't want to tell police that he was, wasn't the only one responsible. He didn't, first of all, he said it's because they didn't really believe him. Like the police of New York just honestly wanted to show the public that they have their shit together. They got their guy. Everything's over with. It's done. We did our job, but they never took the time to investigate the details. That's why I want to kind of shout out to Terry Mari, an investigative journalist. I believe that was his title. I'll correct myself on the screen if it, that's not the case. But he was the only man to really investigate and see if David Berkowitz really was the sole person responsible for all of these murders. And later down the road, you find out that David was technically responsible for only two of those murders, while the rest, he was just the lookout man for John and Michael Carr. That's right, John and Michael Carr killed those other people and participated. And if Carl did see a woman shooting them, it was probably their sister, Nikki Carr, Weedy Carr, whatever the fuck she goes by. She apparently was a police dispatcher, so that's how they had an insight on some of the police activity. That's why they didn't get caught for some time, or in, well, not only that, but the, because the police weren't doing their fucking jobs but that was an insider for them and so if he did see a woman shoot him it was probably her because she was related to them and that's why like i believe oh and so yeah david never i mean he says it in an interview like he just wanted it to be over the police didn't believe him because they just wanted like to pin it on him but also he was tired of arguing them with them and debating with them that he yes committed two crimes and was responsible for a fraction of it but the rest was not him and who knows maybe he maybe he wasn't the killer maybe he was just the lookout guy and they put the blame on david in the end they set it up to where david would take the fall and that's why, I, as I mentioned earlier, and I'll say again, I feel like the whole, oh, I was taking orders from a, dem, a demonic dog that's possessed by an ancient demon named Sam, Sam is a, is a ploy because, like, you know what I mean? I, I don't know. I just feel like they told him, like, yeah, just blame it on the dog. Just plead insanity. Like, you'll be fine. And so I feel like when he was being interrogated, like, he just realized there is no way out of this. There are... They're set on pinning me as a bad guy. There is no room for me to express any knowledge that other people were involved. And so he said he just wanted it to be over with and he basically pleaded or confessed to all six murders just to move on. I don't know, that just sucks. But in the end, I don't know if he even knows this while he's in prison, but in the end, it seems like John and Michael Carr ended up getting their karma 
I'm so sorry. I can't help myself. Honestly, like, it's just kind of like they died in these freak accidents. You can't help but think, like, you know, did some was somebody out for them? Did somebody want to, like, get revenge? Was somebody not happy? Like, you know what I mean? Like, I feel like satanic cults, maybe the reason we don't know about them nowadays is because they just learn how to hide their shit better. And maybe their leaders got pissed off when they left a mess, when they left a breadcrumb trail. So, I don't know. I really don't know. And then David's in prison, so of course nothing's going to happen to him because he's basically in a sanctuary 24-7. It's just things I think about. It reminds me, cults remind me similarly of gangs. Like, if you can't keep your mouth shut, the only way they know nothing's going to get out is if you die like you know if you're six feet under their secrets are safe for sure that's their insurance i mean that's that's about it if i forget anything or if i discover anything new i will be f be sure to share it with you guys in the description box down below tell me your opinions share it with me in the comments i always love to see what you guys your thoughts are or i love to see things i have not considered and see what others are thinking but yeah i think David says in interviews, you know, he's he's a changed man. He's turned to Christianity. He loves helping fellow inmates who are lost in, you know, in, in jail, um, you know, find their way and learn the voice and words of God. And, um, you know, that he's a changed person. When people ask him about this point in his life, he honestly says that he was in a, in a dark time. He doesn't even remember that person. He's, you know, if he could go back in time, he would tell his past self to just keep moving forward, not to get involved with these kind of people. I mean, he, I feel like this cult has so much power over him and he must have seen some really dark shit because he doesn't even name drop. He barely references them as a cult. He just says these group of groups of people and you kind of have to piece it together yourself because he just, he won't say it for what it is. And I don't know if it's because he's scared. I don't know if it's because he feels like he'll be targeted. I don't know, but he barely goes in depth about it. And for the most part, he seems like a very open guy. Like every time the people interviewing him ask him a question, he's always open to answering it. He's honest. But for some reason, when it comes to the details of the cult, it's not that he doesn't want to talk about it. It's just the fact that I feel like he's hesitant to talk about it. I'm not sure. You guys tell me your thoughts. I, I feel like when I'm watching it, it's like they're really pulling teeth when it comes to the cult, um, you know, questions and I feel like he's tiptoeing around that for a reason. Like maybe so he's not killed off like John and Michael Carr. So, yeah. That is the story of the Son of Sam. Uh, Terry Mari is somebody I like to mention because if you guys want more in-depth details of the story, apparently this guy has been collecting years and years almost like his lifetime mission and goal was the research of the son of sam and to understand like what the cult was who was behind the cult what exactly happened how did david really get into this and i don't know his findings aren't really shared with the public though so it's like we're only left to make our own assumptions but I hope you guys enjoyed this video. Thank you so much for joining me. Um, I am looking forward to the next video. Uh, again, I love having a discussion with my viewers down in the comments below. Be friendly, be respectful of each other, and you're more than welcome to be here. Um, thank you so much, you guys. Um, give me some suggestions, by the way, too. Um, let me know what you'd like to learn about next in uh, my next video or what you'd like to discuss next. I'm always open to it. Thank you guys so much. I hope you have a great night, day, afternoon. Please take good care of yourselves and be safe out there. I'll see you in the next one. Bye.